Welcome to Real Feels, the podcast that invites people to be public with their private persona. In a world where we are constantly redefining what it means to be a man, I'd like to take some time to find out who we are, who we aim to be, and the space in between. I'm your host, Brad Gage. Actress, singer, and director Lola Blanc is currently breaking out of her persona. After spending much of her adult life focused on pop music stardom, she's now honing in on being more the version of herself that is herself. And part of that is publicly sharing her perspectives on subjects like Mormonism, which took up much of her childhood, sexism, which took up much of her music career, and allowing people space to make mistakes and grow, which is part of her mission now. Her coming on the show was actually prompted by an Instagram post she shared about how conflicted she is playing to the algorithms of social media that are so entrenched in the male gaze. I'm so glad she could be on the show, and I'm so grateful she decided to be vulnerable with me right now. <laughs> uh, Lola, how, how are you doing uh, right now? How are you doing today? Uh, I'm okay. You're okay? Yeah. Uh, why just okay? What's going on? <sighs> Well, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just, <laughs> just like I, no pressure. I don't like. I, I you're telling me. I uh, there's no, no expectation for who is, or what you you should be right now. Everything is mostly good. I've just been dealing with like some physical stuff that is like it. Everything is great in my life except for this like one stupid physical thing. What, so I'm uh, yeah. like trying to just. Do you feel like that discussing that? I don't want to. It's just like a, a woman problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And because of this woman problem, I can't have any sugar or carbs or starches right now. And yeah. I'm in hell. Yeah. I'm in food, culinary hell. Yeah. Other than that, though. Other than that, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, uh, what does good look like for you? Good looks like feeling productive. Mm -hmm. Uh I am now dating someone I really like. Congrats. I am financially stable, which is like very <laughs> rare for me. <laughs> Even more congrats. Yeah, thank you. It's a lot of good stuff. I'm excited about the projects I'm working on. It's been a nice reprieve from from the year before last year, which was a garbage year. Yeah. I, I've known you for a while. You do you do a lot of stuff. I do a lot of stuff. Where do you think the uh, kind of impetus to do so many different things comes from? Uh, because you're a singer, an a actor, singer, actor, writer, writer director. director. Well, now soon to be public podcaster. Public podcaster, <laughs> yes. Um, so those, that's it. Those are yeah. the only those things. Those are the five. Well, okay. songwriter as well, but yeah, right. that goes with the, that goes with it. Yeah. I don't know. I'm like creatively starving all the time. Mm -hmm. And if I'm only doing one thing, that thing quickly bores me and I need to like add something else into the mix. But I'm not like trying to conquer all it. I really just love film and I and I love making music. There's not like and I'm passionate about cults, which is why I'm starting a cult podcast. Yes. <laughs> but I'm not I'm, I'm never going to be a dancer. I'm never going to be like, you know, there are only a, there's a couple of worlds that I live in and have mm -hmm. skills in. And I just like to conquer all the things I can in those worlds. Was dancer on the table for a little bit? Well, you know, I was an aspiring pop star for most of my uh -huh. life, so it was a problem that I wasn't a dancer. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm not. I'm just not. Like, I'd like to be, but my body doesn't do that. What? <laughs> Talk about the pop star stuff. You, you, so you were writing music for yourself, other people sometimes, mm -hmm. and then, like, of course, I've, I've seen your music videos, listened to your music. What really drew you to it? To music? Yeah. Well, I mean, I started writing songs when I was nine. Yeah. And I loved the Spice Girls. Mm -hmm. Can I swear? Yeah. Okay. I fucking loved the yeah. Spice Girls. Spice um, World? The uh -huh. movie? Oh, my fucking favorite. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Aliens. Oh, Roger my God. Moore. Oh, my. The tour bus? The tour bus it's not is a bus. so big. It's a room. It's so big. It's not a bus. <laughs> you gotta get that big. Yeah. Um, I saw them and, and pop stars like them, and I was like, oh my God, like they're so cool. I have to do that. Yeah. And writing, I started writing songs and I, that was like the way that I learned how to express the things that I was feeling. And it, and then I became an angsty teen and then it like even more became the thing I used to express how I was feeling in really bad poetic angsty lyrics and well, you know. <laughs> gotta get it out there. You gotta get it out there. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's bad now at the time. It was just No, it was always were. bad. But, <laughs> but whose teenage lyrics aren't bad? Right. <laughs> My teenage poems are, are awful for the most part. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, but so great. But important, and it brings you back to those moments. Yeah. How did you formulate the persona that, or the, the kind of, yeah, the whole vibe that you ended up becoming the pop star with? Like what, like it, it's you, but like it's, of course, a, you had to kind of create that to a certain degree. Oh, I totally did. Yeah. I mean, I w- went through so many iterations and like, it, it was actually quite painstaking for a lot of years. My mom and I mm. would be like, okay, what are my like keywords? You know, what are, what are my, um, like, uh, archetypes, my yeah. character archetypes, what's my, what are my colors? You know, just like trying to figure it out because when I was um, up for a record deal in my early 20s, someone, the a and said to me that I didn't have a look. And I was like, no, 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 I have a look. I have a look. Um, and I started like obsessively Googling and trying to figure out what I liked. And for a while, it was very colorful, um, like candy, you know, that like thing that was right. happening. Bright colors yeah. and like, yeah, like... <clears throat> style it's it's hard to really yeah candy you yeah, describe it yeah. as that kind of like this really like saturated really like um almost k-pop-y yeah kind k-pop of. um semi doll like yeah, stuff going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah yeah and then at a certain point i was like this isn't what i want to do this isn't like the vibe of of me yeah. actually anymore like this is me trying to achieve a vibe a vibe that like maybe I think people will like, or like, I like it, but it doesn't feel authentic to me. Mm-hmm. So that's when I switched and I was like, no, nah, I'm a dark bitch. I gotta be a dark bitch. <laughs> this is like the true, the true me. Yeah. <laughs> the, or at least the, closer. The gothic thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean like, I, I do, and I do think, <laughs> at least for me, it's like when I think about you, it's like, yeah, like kind of these gothic things, but also, I mean, I guess it, what's interesting is is generalizing anybody like that because also I, the minute I say that I'm like, but I also know you to, for so many other things. I yeah. Guess, how how have you kind of dealt with the challenge of a little bit having to be defined as one certain thing as a performer in music as an actor? Mm. Uh, uh, do you do you subscribe to that? Did you subscribe to that for a while? And how do you feel about it now? That is such a good question, Brad. Um, I was really frustrated by the idea at first, but I knew that it was a reality. Mm-hmm. That like, if you don't have a distinctive thing that people can describe, you will be forgotten. Yeah, <laughs> which is which sucks because it's like, ch- why can't I just be myself and make my art yes. and like try different things out? But as like, Walt Whitman says, you contain multitudes. You, you're yeah, not just going to be one thing. Why can't I yes. contain multitudes? But the truth is, like, the more specific you are, the more. I mean, at least I have found, and mm-hmm. I think a lot of industry people have found, the more specific, the more likely it is to translate. Yeah. Um, because you are a product. I mean, all of, us, a product. all of us are, who are performers yeah. are products, yeah. our own products. So yeah. Totally. You have to be specific. So yeah. And after a while, I got so used to doing that, to defining my brand and to de- defining like my, my look and my identity that I, I kind of became my strength. Yeah. And now I feel like I'm even at a different, in like a totally different place where I'm like, I don't care anymore. Like I know that that's important, but I don't care the way that I used to care. What does not caring look like? Um, my Instagram is not curated mm-hmm. in the way that I like may try to make it be for a minute. Like it's got all different colors on it and it's not the, <laughs> co- like it is not a pretty feed. Yeah. It's just kind of random. Moving more into film, I'm like, I want to focus more on the craft and less on like, my persona and my image is just like not that interesting to me anymore. Can you pinpoint kind of a moment where you, where you felt yourself releasing that persona? It's been an ongoing process for the past couple of years. Um, And I think last year it really became clear to me because I was like, I really want to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Like I really don't want to be an Instagram girl. That's like not an aspiration of mine. Like followers. are. What is that? Right? It's what, nothing. What, what is it? <laughs> it's nothing. It, it, there, there's an expression there. There, there's some artistry, but mm-hmm. it, it, it's yeah. Like, where's how does it feed you? Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. right. I mean, and it and it does feed some people. Mm-hmm. Feed <laughs> Instagram. Feed. <laughs> but, <laughs> they call it that. I'm sure. <laughs> but for me, I'm like, this isn't this isn't art. This isn't my art. Mm-hmm. This isn't how I like communicate. I mean, sure, it's like how I communicate with my followers technically but like this isn't how I say the things that I really want to say yeah 
like in order to write a good movie, as I've told, been telling you, so freaking difficult. It's my first one. Yeah. Uh, You're writing a feature right now. I'm writing yeah. a feature right now. Mm-hmm. I don't have the time to have a cool Instagram. <laughs> right. Like I don't have the mental energy to do it. Well, the more fruitful work I find anybody is doing more fruitful work in their real life, the yeah. less they're caring about posting because, yeah. because they're getting fed by their life instead right. of uh, this uh, website. Right. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm friends with some girls who are a little bit younger than me, not even that much younger than me, but younger enough that they're on TikTok mm-hmm. and they're spending so much time on their TikToks and I'm like, I can't. Yeah. I can't. I'm too old. I'm 32. I can't do this shit. Yeah. You know, I, got, I just have to like write and like work on my projects. What do you think drives... That, because I mean, I think we've all been in those places where we're like, we're ta- not all of us, but pe- entertainment actors. Mm-hmm. For a lot of people, I, I think we know is like, uh, there's this kind of uh, feeling that we owe it to our career or ourselves to curate and constantly feed the gram. And yeah. so where do you think that comes from? I mean, a lot a lot of places. I think it depends on what people are trying to do. I think there is this idea, and there is truth to this 100%. I know that there's truth to this because I've gotten a, a, a fair amount of work from the internet. Mm-hmm. It's like, if you stay in people's minds, they will think of you to hire you. Yes. Which is a different thing from the Instagram girl thing. I mean, yeah. It's more about just like, oh, these directors follow me, these producers follow me. They have to remember that I'm an actor. Right. They have to remember that I exist, so they think of me for their projects, you know. Um, but that's that's if you're someone who's trying to get hired by people specifically, yeah. I guess. Um, for everyone else, we like attention. Mm-hmm. People want attention. Right. They want to feel validated <laughs> and good about themselves. They want, you know, yeah. got to get those likes. It, it feels good. It feels good. Yeah. What is your philosophy now? when you are posting anything like what as far as how you uh convey yourself online do you have a philosophy behind it do you do you think about this is something that i'm deciding to post over this or this is something that is important for me to send out like what are you thinking about when you're posting uh a lot of conflicting things yeah (laughs) because there is the part of me that wants to post the things i care about Mm -hmm. which is like my writing, you know, an essay that I've written or like um, something that I care about in the news or like a beautiful sunset that I saw or even a picture of my dog. But these things don't get engagement. Right. Whatever. It's it's it doesn't motivate one to post those posts because nobody likes them and then right. you feel unpopular and yes. then you feel like people don't like you. I am trying to fight that right now. I'm trying to fight that instinct, um, which is... It's hard. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's not right. easy. I mean, especially because I do, I, I do still have the thing where I want to stay in people's minds as someone who who they can hire. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. So the but the balance is really difficult. And what has been easiest for me is just not posting that much, just like not focusing that much energy on it. And how do you feel now that you are posting less? Better. Okay. My phone gave me a notification. So I, there was a period in fall where you know, you, it tells you how much screen time you have per day. And it yeah. was like six and a half hours per or day, something per day, yeah. <laughs> averaging. And now I'm down to like three and a half hours yeah. and I'm like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> what a, an organic life I'm living. <laughs> I'm like so proud that it's, it's three incre- and a half well, hours. Well, I mean, you should be, it, it is an addiction. It's, it's not, such not. An addiction. I mean, I, I do think I, I've had conversations with some of my friends, like, uh, in, in 10 years, we're not going to look back at now and go like, Oh yeah, that was good that we were yeah. on those that yeah. much. Uh, whatever's going to happen then it might be a, a version of this that we don't even understand. But it is an addict. Like you, you Jones for it. You do, and, you, and it breaks up your day in a way that's distracting. Yeah, you know. And so, but there's with that bad. There's the good of connecting people. There's the good of people's mm-hmm. voices getting out there and heard, mm-hmm. and like information. Like there globalism like everybody knows information that they need to so like there there is that balance there it's just mm-hmm. like i i do part of the reason why i'm talking about this on the podcast is like is everybody conscious of the amount of power they were giving away to it you know and that's why i, I loved your post and i actually want to read a little bit of that 
scroll slower. Consume thoughtfully. If you see a post that's out of the ordinary and might be vulnerable uh, uh, for someone on the internet, especially if someone's younger, smash the like button. Uh, there's nothing wrong with liking selfies, but there might be many more dimensions there, and that person might be too afraid of a punishing algorithm to reveal them, which might really just be a fear of losing momentum in a still-developing career, which, if you think about it, isn't really that shallow at all. So I, I think this is it's an interesting thing because it's you're at the same time, it's like, I want to be more mindful, but also put, your heart goes out to people who feel the need for that. Yeah. Do you have goals as far as your interactions with it for the new year? Like, is, is, there, is there a new found uh, perspective on it that you have come to? I guess I just want to be... I mean, and I've been vulnerable on the internet with my words for a long time, but I it's been harder for me to be vulnerable in posting things that I'm not incentivized to post. So for a long time, it was all pictures of me looking as sexy as possible. It was always a photo shoot, mm -hmm. you know, like very like airbrushed and not looking how necessarily I actually look um, because those were the posts that would get likes. Right. And then it starts to make me look like this person that I'm not. Like I like to get dressed up, but I also don't like it's not an accurate portrayal of the person that I am because yeah. most days I'm not really wearing much makeup and most days I'm hunched over my computer and like working on stuff like or doing activism or writing or like spending time with people. It's just, just it like it limits the parts of yourself um, that you put on the Internet or it can if if you let yourself be incentivized by the likes. Right. I know it's a very complicated thing. It's a, it's a lot to pull apart because also, and this is just uh, something that I have learned a lot. And, and this is uh, a lot of credit to most of the credit to my partner, Allie, is just kind of making me think about how I engage as a man mm -hmm. on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Because the root of why you're posting these things is the whole app is kind of based in the male gaze. Yeah. And so... It's the problem of participating, or, or just, I mean, anybody selfies. Like, if my photos of my face do better than anything else, too. Right. So it's just like people who are following you like, like you, they so like they like to your see face. You, yeah. But um, for me, it is this interesting thing about like how uh, it can kind of mess with your ideas of like specifically like women as things instead yeah. of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think. Uh, it's a, it's an ego machine, which all of yeah. all, so much of what we do out here is an ego machine. So, mm -hmm. so that it, it just, when you posted about all that, it really spoke to me because it is, it's this very difficult balance as someone who is building a career and needing to be, needing to be known and recognized or else, because it's all about just top ahead who's right, right for this thing. Right. And so that, that's why I'm just, I'm just very curious to, to, to know how, how you're maneuvering it and how you how you plan on it or is it just kind of like a day by day let's see how this goes I mean I'm still <laughs> gonna post pictures of my face yeah. I posted a headshot yesterday yeah. you know? it, it's important <laughs> yeah headshot. yeah right. yeah like I don't think it's realistic to expect people to just ab ab abolish that altogether Exa oh, absolutely yeah that's <laughs> especially yeah. performers mm -hmm. it is interesting to, like the way that men perceive um, women's Instagrams because I have noticed in the past year um, I've noticed a little bit more judgment from men than I ever really have which is interesting because I don't think my Instagram isn't particularly like like there are no butt pics on mm -hmm. my Instagram you know it's like I absolutely think butt pics are great and you're welcome to do them they are not on my Instagram yeah um, but I've run into judgment from a couple of men who basically thought that it was an indicator of like sh like vanity or shallowness mm. um and uh, like attributed qualities to me that that aren't really there and kind of projected things onto me based on my social media alone these are men that you know are friends with or, or random men or uh, people like men you from care dating about? apps okay um it's also happened with friends but a lot of the time, these are the same people who are liking the pictures where I look hot. You know what I mean? So it's like, you want to see it. Like, you're the problem. Yes. 
But like then you turn around and think that there's something wrong with me mm -hmm. because I'm posting the things that get me the likes right. that keep me on people's minds. You know, it's such there is no way to win. <laughs> there's no fucking way to win. <laughs> the reality of social media is that if I only posted the things that were interesting and introspective and deep, like I would have no followers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like people wouldn't. I mean. I guess unless I were trying to be a poet or an author and like it depends, you know. Right. For for the goals that you have, this is kind of par for the course. Is yeah. What yeah, this, yeah. This is part of the job. My face a is bit. a big part of a couple of my jobs. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not a part of the writing and directing, but uh, I still make my living as an actor mm -hmm. and as an artist. Um, my face is just like... It's just what we're dealing yes. with. Yes, <laughs> again, the product. Yeah. It, yeah, it's part of the product. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and like as I transition, and I think that's part of why it, it's been a little bit easier for me to transition away from it because I am moving more behind the camera, but like not completely. Yeah. You know? No, for sure. I, I'm going through the same thing right now too. Uh, mm. it, it, not the same thing, but it is like I'm trying to reel back, but also like um, I am an actor. I, ha I just took some headshots. I'm just like, well, I want to post this. But like, is it like, where, where is it? Who is it feeding? Is it okay with me? And mm. I think it is for me, at least I, I've decided like, okay, if I'm conscious of why I'm doing it, right. then I think it's okay. Uh -huh. I think that's the best you can do. I do feel the most addicted and the most like obsessive when I've just posted. So I am finding that as long as I am posting less often <laughs> yeah. overall, I'm just happier. Yeah. I don't know what the way out is. I, I just either. I like talking to I people about way it and going, out is, what can we do? What I know. I feel like deleting deleting the apps <laughs> is the way out. And I'm like opening it when you need to use it and yeah. then deleting it again. But I'm not strong enough to do that. Yeah. I can't do that. It is funny. I think it's just getting to work is the only mm -hmm. solve. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying. Like you know, you're you're working all day or you're on a set or something and you don't feel like you need it and then you yeah. get home and you're like, Oh, I feel good. I don't need yeah. this. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, just, I'm saying that for me too, like this year, I'm like getting to work more, just yeah, working getting to work. Yeah, absolutely. I think you use your, so your social media really well, uh, to, to promote all of the aspects of you, what you're doing. Um, I, in preparation for this, was reading some of your, some of your articles. I mean, you've, oh. you've you wrote an article for Vice about, I mean, a very incredible story that you've talked about your past in in the Mormon church and, and, and with, you know, these, these men who, uh, kind of just really negative affected your childhood and your family. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also I, I really enjoyed reading, um, your medium articles, your, your writing on oh, medium. And so I, I did want to talk to, to you a little bit about one of them because I read, I read it right before I came over here what is it called? Your your dick's not that impressive. What what is that one called? Um, your dick's not that irresistible. Yeah, your dick's not that irresistible, <laughs> which is great title. Thanks. And, and draws you in, and it, and it is. There's a lot in there that after reading it, I I got I got sick to my stomach mm. in a way that I think was really important. Where I was mm. like, the the breadth of experiences that you and so many women I know or don't even know having to experience sexism mm -hmm. so often do you feel like things are getting uh a lot better or do you think they're they're still kind of the same as they were before um i think they're getting a little better a little better i think that people are more aware because they have to be the reasons for them being more aware are not great people are afraid of you know people are more scared to rape because they'll get in trouble for it, then they were afraid to rape because raping is bad. Right. <laughs> yes. Know? But like that's still a step forward. But what's like, I guess in my mind, um, when all of this stuff started coming out and everyone started posting, I was like, cool, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody gets it and yeah, game's over. Solved. Yeah. Was there really a moment where you're like, oh, maybe this is... <laughs> I was like, maybe men will get it now. <laughs> like, we're talking about it in a way that we've never talked about it yeah. before. You know, the dam has broken. Um, obviously, it turned out not to be the case. <laughs> I do think people are more aware, but I will still run into people, like, whether on set or, or whatever it is, who will say things. I'm like, you 
in the post me too era think that that's an mm -hmm. okay thing to say or think like th you know not everyone's exposed to the same information and i think a big part of it is something that i talk about in the essay which is like i think what happened with me too or at least what i observed happening and in, in some of the people that i know is that they're like oh harvey weinstein bad 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 dudes obviously bad rapey bad rapists cool i'm not them I know I'm not a bad right. rapist man. So thank God we got rid of him. And then in the process are not examining their own behavior and, um, you know, the more subtle ways in which violations can happen. Yeah. And that's, and I think that's, those were the aspects of the article that I was like, this is the little moments. I think mm -hmm. something like cat, that, that story, cat person really highlighted mm -hmm. it well too, where it's like the breadth of the patriarchy and, and, and the amount of programming that is just in man yeah. uh, uh, seeps into all the cracks. And I guess one question I would have is, you know, having experienced this and, and definitely thought about it a lot and probably talked to a lot of men about it, what are some, um, some ways that you see bigger change happening for the better? Hmm. I think education is a huge part mm -hmm. of it. And from what I understand, a lot of colleges and universities now have enthusiastic consent policies in place versus the, you know, the outdated no means no thing, which of course gets a lot of people harmed. That seems to be more of a widespread thing now, which is very, very encouraging. I do think it needs to start younger. I do think that um, high school, junior high. In maybe, sex ed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you know, I grew up in the Midwest where we just didn't talk about sex. We did not talk about sex. And the like one sex that I remember class I remember taking was just like use condom. Yeah. I mean, so I, I grew up Mormon and sex was a very taboo subject. Um, and when I did make the choice to finally start having sex, which is a whole nother story, I felt real guilty about it. Um, while you were still in the church. I was not still in the church, okay. but in my heart. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's not like, it's like, it's like it a breakup. Go. It's like, oh, no more. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure it was still, the guilt yeah. was still in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It took a while. I don't know if it's gone, but <laughs> <laughs> story for another day. Obviously, we live in a patriarchy. Obviously, even in the like 80s and 90s, it was a lot more um, patriarchal even than even today, but especially in religion and especially in a conservative Midwest Mormon situation. Mm -hmm. Um I felt like man's pleasure was what mattered. Um, I had to please him. If I wasn't, you know, enjoying it, that that was my problem, and I needed to just like be quiet and let it happen. Yeah, you know. When were the moments where you learned that you had more power than you were led to believe? Hmm. It was a gradual process through talking to other women through talking I, to other women i would guess i was gonna say men yeah. i'm like no men it's probably just gonna be women who are empowering you about this <laughs> unless i'm incredible guy which <laughs> can happen i mean there might have been a nice ex-boyfriend yeah i just way. think about all like i have had um, many strong female role models who i've known and like that's why i've learned because mm -hmm. you care about this person they're gonna tell you this so yeah, yeah. it's uh I'm sure, yeah, just a very gradual process yeah, of empowerment. Yeah, it was a gradual thing. It started with like, I mean, it started with realizing that the, like I was uh, dating a certain type of man over and over again and a, like a sister, a woman who was like a sister to me um, kind of brought it to my attention that I was selecting those men. And that was sort of a turning point where I started to realize that like I have power over who I spend my time with. Right. It wasn't happening to you. It was, right. but also you chose. Right. To be I yes. was like, yeah. I was selecting people who were not treating me well. Mm -hmm. And that like the glass shattered at that moment. And I was like, Oh, I'm doing this. <laughs> You're in control. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> People like to say, oh, I attract narcissists. And I'm like, bitch, <laughs> you are attracted to narcissists. Yes. Like, there's a difference. Well, in any relationship, uh, uh, and th this is, again, this is something uh, my girlfriend Allie says all the time. You, no matter how long you're in it, if you guys are in it for a bit, you're each side's always getting something, even mm -hmm. if it is uh, mm -hmm. abusive. Mm-hmm. Both sides are still in it for a reason. Right. And a lesson. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that the abuse is is good or like should be happening. But, right. but like when you're with somebody, you're with them for a reason. Right. You know? Right. I mean, if you grew up in chaos, you're drawn to chaos. Yeah. Um, 
which does not make abuse anybody's fault. Right. But, or any victim of yeah, abuse. Like they're, yeah, like they want to be abused. No. Right. But it's like, it just kind of, it's kind of how people work a little yeah, bit. Yeah. yeah, I mean, co- codependency, I believe, is a real, real thing. Um, oh, yeah. But, but. Hey, in- you've had a little bit of that? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've mostly uh, had really, <laughs> really great, healthy ex-boyfriends. Um, That's great. With the exception of one. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in that... <laughs> and then you always just remember it and learn the lesson, yeah. I did. Oh, my God. So many lessons. <clears throat> what do you think is, is one of your greatest lessons you've learned uh, through your relationships? That I don't have to tolerate behavior that doesn't make me happy. Mm. I felt a lot of pressure for a long time to be a cool girl yes, and um, to be real chill and to not ask for a relationship and to just be like, mm, anything's cool with me, you know? Um, and boy, was I depressed. <laughs> boy, did that not make me happy. Right. And that sister like girlfriend kind of counseled me to have my first conversation with a man where I was like, I'm not interested in something casual. So if you're interested in something casual, then I can't do this. And it was so scary. Um, but I, but we, we, and we parted ways that first time and I felt so much better Mm -hmm. afterward because I was prioritizing myself over another person. And I got a lot of practice with that conversation over the years dating in LA. Yeah. And every time I'm like, thank God, crisis averted. Like, what was I going to go, like, let that go on for six months, a year, just like secretly hoping it'll turn into something? Fuck no, I don't have that kind of time. And I see it happen with women still. I mean, you know, people don't want to be seen as needy. They, they think mm-hmm. that somehow expecting uh, or having a standard of like, if I'm going to be sleeping with someone, it's got to be going somewhere. Like, mm-hmm. that, that makes them needy somehow or clingy or like a t- I felt like a typical girl which is not a feeling that I like um <laughs> and I was able Why? to <laughs> because girls are weak <laughs> Brad right <laughs> you know girls are needy and emotional mm-hmm. And as like I was able to reframe that and be like no this is fucking strong to be able to be like I don't need you in my life if you don't meet my standards and if you aren't behaving the way that I need a person to behave, then I have no room for you. Like that's strong as fuck. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's just, it's being true to yourself and, and uh, yeah, not playing to a role. Right. Yeah. And yeah, it it is just stuff that you won't know right away. And maybe we can start knowing earlier and earlier, but it is about having those experiences Mm -hmm. and and losing and and learning the lessons. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it sounds like you're in a pretty good spot right now with a lot of this stuff. Thank you. Hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) I'm technically in a relationship now. Okay, we're saying technically in a relationship. No, I am in a relationship (laughs) now. It feels so new that it feels weird to say. It's so new. It is funny to hear technically in a relationship (laughs) because I'm like, okay, what? How did it work its way up to from non-technical? No, I'm in a relationship. I'm in a relationship. I don't know why I feel like I haven't earned being able to say it yet. But yes, I'm in a relationship. Yes. It's only been like a little over three months. So sure. it's still it's still pretty new. Brand new. Speaking to uh, relationships for a little bit, what are some qualities about this person that you're like, that, that you find uh, refreshing or that you find uh, uh, like hopeful? Mm-hmm. So many. He's so good. He's a good person. He um, really cares about substance over um, image or style or um, surface level things. Mm -hmm. He's really, he really, really cares about substance um, in a person and in the art he consumes to the point where I'm like, do you have any guilty pleasures? (laughs) (laughs) Um, More than most people I've ever dated, he's like very willing to um, recognize when he is responsible for something or has done something and to just like admit to it and be like, I apologize. Like mm-hmm. I, I will make an effort to be better, which is just so, it feels so nice. It's so refreshing because you know, um, a lot of men that I've dated have been socialized to not really look at themselves necessarily and not be introspective like that. Um, and he is like the most introspective yeah. <laughs> and like really wants to like take responsibility for the things he's responsible for, which aren't that many there. He's like 
sure. pretty much a good guy. But every, but yeah, but everybody, yeah. things come up. Things come up. Always. Things come there up. There will never not be things. If nothing came up, we would all be so bored. <laughs> <laughs> like things have to come yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, things have to come up. I am a perfectionist and like I, I am trying to be better at being like, some things are just going to be shitty sometimes and it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Conflict is okay. I struggle with conflict. Um, that's another thing that he's really good at is being like, th- that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> things aren't, oh, this particular area is not good right now and that's okay. Yeah. You know, like you feel things about it. That's okay. Um, Sounds like he's got his ego in check pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, we, I, we don't even hammer too much on this, this uh, young gentleman. No, no, he, tol- um, he totally does. Yeah. He totally does. <laughs> I do want to uh, circle back a little bit, you, because you did mention something interesting where, where you said that there are still those remnants of the guilt from uh-huh. being a Mormon. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, why? Where, where is that? What, what, what is still kind of, what kind of, what embers of that are still you inside know, you? <clears throat> I've talked about it in therapy a lot, and... It's been hard to separate out because I have the religiously imposed shame Mm -hmm. about sex. And then I have the culturally imposed shame about sex. When I started having sex, first, my first feeling was like, oh, I'm doomed. I'm going, Mm. Mormons don't even believe in hell, which is hilarious, but I still felt like I was going to hell. Yeah. Mormons believe in an outer darkness, which is a very specific place that I was definitely not going to go. Um, but I'd be in like a slightly lower tier of heaven because I had premarital sex. Okay. <laughs> and you don't want to be in the slightly lower tier of heaven because um, your family is all righteous and they're in the higher tier of heaven. So I cried for three hours the first time I had sex. <clears throat> But then I would still just feel like I was somehow ruining my purity or like um, as, as my like number got higher, I felt a lot of shame about that because I just thought men want someone who's like not been with a lot of other men, um, you know, Uh, or I would feel really guilty if I had sex with somebody too soon because I felt like, I don't know, just like not living up to the standard of woman that I was expected to be Mm -hmm. somehow by someone. So now I I basically have accepted that casual sex is not something that I like. It's not something that I do. I haven't had it in a long time. I can't, I mean, I sometimes I wonder, like, am I not able to have casual sex because of these ideas that were implanted in my head growing up? Or am I not able to have casual sex because I genuinely don't like casual sex? Like, I can't really tell the difference. Sure. Um, <clears throat> but mostly it's fine as long as I'm sleeping with somebody who I care about, who I know cares about me. Mm-hmm. But then sometimes... <laughs> There's sometimes something in there when I'm in a relationship and I'm in love, this thing will come up, this feeling that I'm like doing something that's like bad or yeah. wrong. And it only happens like when we're like pretty deep in and I'm pretty committed and I'm like, love him, um, that it will come up. So I'm like, is that, is that a fear of intimacy? Is that Mormon shame that I'm just bringing into relationships? It's like, it's really hard to pull apart. Yeah. It's, but it, it, definitely just that young programming yeah. is like, you can't just drop it. Yeah. Like it's, it is, it has to be processed out the amount of time you put in to absorbing that, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. just that much time usually takes to just work on it. But yeah. also the Mormon aspect, I mean, do you still hold any of those spiritual beliefs at all? Hell no. Okay. <laughs> Or yeah. like any of it, like because it is interesting. Like Mormonism, very seems culty, and there's a lot of like oppression and stuff like that. Was there is there anything about it that you were like, well, this one thing was good, or are you pretty much like, it was all bad? I mean, look, my dad is still Mormon, my little brother is still Mormon, a lot of my family. Um, I think that it works for them and it makes them happy. It provides a system for them that they need to organize their lives, uh, and I don't think it's. I think in many ways it's not harmful. I think when it comes to um, homosexuality and sexuality in general, it is harmful. Mm -hmm. But in most aspects of life, um, it's fine, you know, to go into church. They're having community. They're Mm -hmm. like 
doing volunteer work. My dad's on his Mormon senior mission right now with his wife and they're just like volunteering every day. And I'm like, that's great. They should do that. Yeah. You know, most of the Mormons I know are just, are really like very nice people. They're good people and they care about others. And what do you think of the, this idea that is now kind of popping up a little bit more about um, redemption and about uh, healing and people getting better in those, in the situations where they have hurt people? Like, what do you, how do you feel about some of that stuff? I think that there has to be a way and the, the, for people to have room to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and you obviously have to have clear, hard boundaries with people who are manipulative and are not actually learning and it can be hard to tell the difference. And I think that's where it gets hairy. Yeah. The reason I feel strongly about that is because like I, like I talk about in the essay, I mean, a lot of the people that I know have engaged in bad behavior or the people that I've hooked up with or dated who did not fucking know. They like did not know that what they they were so socialized a certain way um, that it didn't occur to them that that behavior was bad because Mm -hmm. everybody around them was doing it or whatever. And I don't think culture is a way to like, I don't think we can totally dismiss behavior that way, but I think it's important to consider it. Um, and consider the possibility that people need to be taught and are able to learn and are able to grow and change. Um, the education you were talking about. Yeah, like that's, education's it, that's important. Still the answer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When I think about racism, obviously we all want to be like, well, I'm not racist. I'm against racism. Racism is bad. But it would not be honest if I were to say I have never said anything racist. That would be totally fucking dishonest because yeah. I, in my younger years, did not fucking know. Like, I, I have certain things that I had said in my teenage years have like come back and I've been like, holy shit, I cannot believe I said that or I cannot believe that I thought that. Like, I was not exposed to the information like nobody had taught me and like we weren't having these conversations Mm -hmm. then culturally the internet wasn't what it was and like I now am like totally reformed and I literally go to anti-racist events but I still am gonna fuck up sometimes because I'm not perfect and I'm still learning and I will always be learning and I think it would be really really hypocritical for me as a white person to be like well you have to give me room to grow and not extend the same courtesy to men sure there are all kinds of intersecting forms of oppression and we're all ignorant about at least some of them (laughs) and we're all fucking up at least some of the time yeah you know and like we we have to be trying but like it's important to acknowledge that it's a process. Yeah, and just having empathy for each individual. Yeah. Uh, in the moment, so where it's like empathy to the level of like understanding where they're coming from, who they are, mm-hmm. and seeing if it's if it's something that is a trend. It's like, well, then that's you knew that this is bad, or mm-hmm. maybe you didn't know that this. And and mm-hmm. looking at people. As individuals and not generalizing. It it can be easy to categorize things and put things in black and white. And I don't think that that's a healthy way to approach the world. Yeah. If people were to put you in a category and view you in a black and white way, you would be very upset about that, you know? Because you're not. You're not. Nobody is. No. No person is general. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's specific. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, uh, But speaking uh, about the, you know, your, your past in Mormonism, you're starting a podcast. I would love if you want to talk about it right now. What yeah, yeah. what is it about? What are you doing with it? Um, I wish I had a release date for you. Um, my podcast is called Trust Me, and I co-host it with a cool gal named Megan Granger, and we both grew up in cult-like situations, um, or or cults, straight up cults, depending on how you look <laughs> <Yeah>. at it. <laughs> Mine was like a tiny cult. cult. Uh, Mine was a tiny cult and hers was like a very extreme religion, but they're both cults. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So the podcast is about cult, extreme belief and the abuse of power. And basically we are talking to people who have had experiences with all of these things. There's nothing I find more interesting in the world than people... Well, I find manipulation really interesting, but also getting sucked in and doing things that you would never do or believing Mm -hmm. things that just like aren't you at all 
and having to come out of that and and reframe your whole life like I just find the whole process so fascinating and especially because my mom you know she experienced it in such a such an extreme way um and the the manipulators themselves are so interesting anyway so we talk we just talk to people and hear their stories we have people who were in um well actually we had current FLDS ladies on who are current um polygamists okay um who FLDS what is that again? the uh fundamentalist Mormons okay the ladies in the pastel dresses with gotcha. the poofy hair people from all different kinds of groups and mm-hmm. it's really cool they're all amazing and it's like just been so interesting to hear their stories so yeah that will be out soon cool yeah this seems like this project is leaning into your experiences your past your knowledge what would you say is your greatest gift my greatest yeah, gift like your 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 greatest gift that you have that you have that you have to give to the world um i think that my greatest gift is actually bringing people together um br- to collaborate and to um create and to be empowered when they are not being empowered by the outside world mm-hmm. um that's something that i feel really passionate about i have like my all-female horror collective and um I, it, it's, it's fatal collective fatal fatal collective, collective. i've <laughs> i've been reading it in my head wrong the whole time. <laughs> there's an e on fatal. the end Brad. i know but i was still like maybe a <laughs> uh, fatal which makes sense femme fatale i yes, get it yes but yes. uh you guys make uh, horror films we do yes yes but in general like i it's it's something i care a lot about empowering people to be able to do the thing that they want to do when other people aren't um so bringing people together i'm gonna say that's my greatest thing love it <laughs> and how uh how does your heart feel right now Lola how does my heart feel hopeful yeah cool (laughs) why (laughs) because I'm in a new relationship and he's got a lot of potential and I think we've got a lot of potential and I got a lot of creative things that are making my heart happy yeah love can open up the whole thing sometimes and it's nice yeah yeah it's cool (laughs) well uh I cannot thank you enough for being here. This has been lovely. And thank you for having me. Yeah, and thanks for being vulnerable talking about all this stuff. You're welcome. Cool. <laughs> all right. All right.